as a custom. Culture. Culture changed. Before they used to eat by their hands, now they use forks and spoons. Before they used to take camel ride, nowadays they take the helicopters and they take the jets to travel from one area to another area. Before they used to read big books, carry big books with them, now, nowadays they carry the laptop with them. Things that are applicable to the body, to the lifestyle, they can do it any way they want. Islam says there is no problem with it. And if things change, if the time change, you can also change with that. One day Imam al-Sadiq was sitting in Masjid al-Haram. Imam al-Sadiq when you would look at him, you will see that he had two features. First, the holiness of an Imam, and second, the majesty of a king. The way that he dresses himself was so elegant and so beautiful. So he was sitting in Masjid al-Haram, a man approached him and told him, Ja'far ibn Muhammad, you are the grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib, who used to wear those, you know, worn off clothes, old dress, thick one. Now I can see you, you're wearing such an elegant clothes, very nice dress. And can you explain to me, you are the grandson of that Imam? The Imam السلام, told him things have changed. That during my grandfather's time, people were living in poverty. People did not have money. Therefore, Ali ibn Abi Talib had to sympathize with the rest. He lived in that style. But when things change over time, and people's affairs become better, and they can accommodate, and they have, you know, they have financial ability to buy things, why not? And believe me, the akhyar deserve better to wear those clothes than the fujjah. If, if things change in a time, the movements should change to a better state more than they deserve it more than the non movement the non-believers. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually, when he weighed the two, he of course, he prefers the mu'mini. Therefore, my time has changed. The affairs have changed. The financial ability of the people have changed, therefore I am accompanying them. Ali ibn Abi Talib used to be the leader. People didn't have that, didn't have the economic means, therefore he was living in their own level. But I am different, therefore things can change. So anything that pertains to style of eating, drinking, sheltering, you live before they used to live for example in woods now you want to build a concrete you want to big, build a big mansion that's as long as it is gone coming from halal there is no problem with it in any way you want to live that pertains to something that is changeable that changes over time however there are things that apply to the soul and to the spirit the spirit is the one that deals with this thing at that time, Islam says, Behold, you cannot go faster than what you should. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said this as a permanent, stable, non changing. Therefore, do not change the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a very intricate balance. If you touch at one area, you will screw up in another area. Therefore, you gotta be careful not to do that. Now, when you have a society that does abortion, they do the sonar and once they find out, for example, I'm just giving an example. Once they find that the fetus is a female or male, depending on what they want, they do the abortion. Now imagine in a society that always does this, by time, what happens? They have generated two races, the female and the male. Which one is more? If they are prone to kill the females, eventually you will see in a society the, the male population have grown up. We have to think about it rational, rationally. Over time, the male population have increased, while the female population have decreased. What is the solution? Either they're going to go for homosexuality, or they're going to go extinct. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told you, this is a balanced thing. You touch in one area will affect you in another area. The abortion is connected with the sexual orientation of a human being. And other things, if we think carefully, we come to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this connection, this network all intricate, next to, connected to each other. Therefore, 
things that apply to the spirit should not be changed. While things that are applied to the body, there are, it's okay to change them. They depend on the style, they de depend on the customs and the cultures of people. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Now, do we mean that the West or secular societies are moralless? They don't have morality? Of course not. And sometimes, believe me, you will see morality in the Western countries much more than the ones that we have in our own societies, in our own Islamic societies. The Western societies, secular societies, they have moralities. But where is the difference between an Islamic ideology and a secular ideology? It depends on the deriving force behind this. What is the motive of morality? The motive is different. The motive for the Islamic society or religious society and ideology is different than that for the Western and secular ideology. Where is the difference? If you ask someone in a secular society that happens to be non-religious, meaning that he does not believe in God and in hereafter, you tell him, why do you want to be nice? What is the reason? You want to be a good person, a noble person. Help the poor. There is a guy who is blind. You want to pass the street. Do you grab his hand and let him pass or you leave him? If he say yes, I would like to help him, you tell him what is your motive? What is the answer? The secular philosophy, they say it is based on reward. But what is this reward? They tell you there has to be a reward. I do something in order to gain something. Just for the sake of an action, people don't do stuff. It has to be a motive and it has to be a return. What is that return? They tell you it is based on a reward. Like what? If you become a noble person, that if you help that person, grab his hand and let him pass the street, go the, on the other side, People will look at you in a good eye. They tell you, you are a noble person. Basically, the return is that people will say you are a good person, that you are a noble person. You ask somebody who goes to defend his country and enrolls in military. You tell him, why are you in military? What is the reason you want to defend your country? He said, because people later on will come and say, this guy is a noble man. He sacrificed his life for us. So we can survive. He sacrificed his life. Therefore, I will get the Medal of Honor. Maybe not in, during my lifetime. Later on, someone will praise me. Someone will say that you have done a good thing. Basically, the secular ideology belongs to this. Tells you, be a good person a philanthropist, a nice person, in order for people to say, you are a good person. History will acknowledge that you have been a good person. So basically, it depends on the reward. Now, this reward has a three features. Number one, it is short-lived, transient. For example, today I am an honest, a good person, a noble person, and I help certain community. I build a street for them. For a few years, they thank me, they acknowledge me, and they're happy with it. But over time, that generation is gone, and you new generation will come, right? Maybe 10 years from now, someone will come and build a bridge. Do they ever think about my street again? No, because somebody else came and did something more fantastic than what I did. Therefore, over time, my charity, my work goes into forgotten state. People will not ever for remember me. They will forget what I have done. By time things are changing, right? People will forget, tend, a human being tend to forget. So the first thing is that this is a short lived, it's something that I do no matter how good I do. Eventually, at a point of time, people will forget that good thing that I did. That's number one. Number two, it is symbolic. It is not a real reward. No one will give me a physical gift. No one will give me a physical reward till you 
tell me, good, you did this, in return we are gi we're giving you this one. We are talking about morality. Yes, some people do good things, but in return they have a contract with the community, with the city to pay them back. But I am talking when you become only a noble person to help for no return. That return, the praise of people, is symbolic. Only they will tell you, good job, but you cannot cash that thing, right? You can't go to the bank and tell them, you know, there were 200 people who have told me thank you very much, we love you so much. Please, can you cash that in the bank? So that's not cashable, okay? I also thank you, but nothing becomes tangible. So that's the second thing. The third thing, this is relative and changing. It says that you have to be good in order for others to praise you. Meaning that I have to do something that the society will see and then they will acknowledge my work. Now what about if the society does not see? I am by myself, okay? I am by myself. At that time, if the society does not see, would I do that thing or not? If you say yes, you would do that, the whole purpose has been defeated because they say, do a good thing in order for history to acknowledge. But if the history doesn't give a damn about me, tells me do it or you don't do it, I'm not going to acknowledge you. Will I do that thing or not? So basically I will not do it. Why would I waste my time doing something that others don't care about it? When I am by myself, no one will pay attention. Would I, would I do the same, the same moral thing that tells me in public, you have to do it, this is a moral thing because people will acknowledge it. If people do not acknowledge it, then what happens? Meaning that I'm not going to do it. Therefore, people to be, more of, to be more hypocritic, to show off, to have double standard. In the public, they do good things. But once they are in private, when there is no one watching, they don't do good things. Have you seen people in the middle of night? They pass the traffic light and be, you know, go so, uh, with a full speed. Why is that? Because no one has it been a policeman there. Do they pass the traffic light? Of course not. So as long as there is no watchful eyes, you do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. Therefore, this act of morality is relative. Nowadays, I do it because people are watching, they are praising me. But once I know that they don't praise me, therefore I give up, I don't do it. Now let's look at what Islam says. Islam number one, when he looks at your deed, tells you number one, the reward for you is not a transient and it's not short-lived. Rather, it is something that you will have it forever. You cannot even imagine the end of it. Once you pass, you go to the hereafter, you will be rewarded for something that will never be completed, will never be stopped. The ayah says, جَزَاؤُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ جَنَّاتُ عَدْنِ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا For whatever you think, there is no end to this, there is no, this is bottomless. No matter how long will it take, this is eternal. Everlasting, will never finish. That's number one. Compared to the short-lived reward that the secular society tell you do if you do this one good. So here Islam is providing you with an alternative. Telling you if you do this one, the reward is everlasting, will not finish. That's number one. Second, it is not symbolic. It is something tangible. Something that you will feel, something that you will enjoy and you will please yourself. Only the width of this Jannah, as big as the heavens, as big as this, the, the skies and earth, all together.